Ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Paul Craig up against Johnny Walker at UFC 283. We've lost your head, but you're here. You're here with us. Fantastic. I'm back again. I'm back again. I've been uh, very keen to speak to you for a number of years, man. Uh, you know, absolute top boy in the light heavyweight division. Uh, is this a potentially a bit of a cracker? Johnny Walker, I don't think is hardly ever involved in a boring fight. Do you feel like you can get him and, and wrap him up? Um, I believe so. Um, my jiu-jitsu is, uh, I believe, one of the best in the division. I think you have to have that confidence getting into these fights where a guy as wild as Johnny Walker. He's got that crazy power. He's got that crazy athleticism. We see him winning fights and doing back flips and doing all these tornado kicks. But what I believe I've got over him is just the 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 composure that allows me to get in tight to him and allows me to drag him to the mat. Uh, he is, as you say, a very exciting fighter, but I believe I'm and um, the two, when the main card for this event is going to be an explosive fight. Do you think he's going to be able to live with your jiu-jitsu? We know him for his highlight real knockouts, but despite being a Brazilian, we don't really know him for his jiu-jitsu. Yeah, I, I think his last fight uh, against Kuti Laba, naked choke submission again, is uh, we have called the game plan. He was making mistakes. Basic, He should have been doing the basic fundamentals in the areas, and he wasn't doing them. So does that give me a wee bit of hope that my jiu-jitsu is baby like Trump is? Massively it does. Uh, as I said, he will have some level of jiu-jitsu. It's not like he's getting no jiu-jitsu at all. He's working with Kavanaugh over at SPG, who have some of the best jiu-jitsu practitioners in Europe. Do I think he can learn what I know in jiu-jitsu over a fight camp? I don't think he can do it. I don't think he can learn the defence. and I don't think he can... You know, it's one of these things we'll see come fight. Hang with my jiu-jitsu, too much time in the jiu-jitsu, allow a guy to dominate me in these areas. Johnny Walker is a guy who kind of seems to lost his way a bit. I think he's been quite open about that. Uh, he got back to winning ways against Kutalaba, but is, is it just an example of how ridiculous the level is at, at the top of this division? Because there was talk of him fighting John Jones at one point when he was on a streak, maybe he got pushed too early, I don't know. But what did you make of that whole situation? And do you, do you find, have you seen a lot of that? Yeah, it's, it's, it's part of being the light heavyweight division, you know. Um, one good shot can land you in a bit of trouble. You know, one second in our sport can totally change the whole dynamics. When you look at the lighter weight class, when it's back and forward and the guys are trading shots, the guys are in these grappling exchanges. When you get to this these heavier weights, it becomes a lot harder to do these kind of things. And in the end of knocking somebody out with some wild shots, Johnny, uh, he was swinging these shots, dropping them, and then there's a level that haven't sort of increasing as he was getting in that top 10. And as you were saying, the, the mentioning of him versus the champ, the GOAT, the, the, and John Jones. Once his level, once he got to that high level, that stuff wasn't working. So the, the crazy knockouts weren't coming because the guys he was going up against were, were well-rounded, were able to see it coming, were able to uh, change their direction and, and, and commit their shots better than what the guys at the lower levels were doing. So then he kind of goes on this slump where he's losing a few fights back to back. He then just becomes another guy in the light heavyweight division. And then we see him coming back with this victory over Kuti Laba. Do I believe I'm a top 10 fighter that can see what his craziness is coming? Yes, I massively believe that I'm going to be able to see this, his dangerous shots coming. Um, and I do believe that I'm going to be able to get in and take him to the mat. Do I believe that he's on a resurgence? I don't think so. I think he's been found out in this division. I think what what's happened is people know what to expect. So that's why he, why he went away, started working with the SPG guys, started to kind of rein in some of these crazy moves and then make them more about, he was more composed, he was more uh, watching his shots, picking them. But then we see what happened when he, when he went up against Jamal Hill and Jamal Hill outstruck him and made him look like a very average fighter, caught him with a, it was like a backhand he caught him with and then put him to sleep. Ideally, that's the situation I'd love to showcase on Saturday night, you know, composure, walking forward, picking him apart, landing some big shots, ultimately leading to the, the victory with a knockout. But in this sport, you'll take any. You'll take a knockout, you'll take a submission. Um, the only thing I don't want to do is go to the judges in Brazil. I don't want to go to the judges in any country. But if I want to get close to being a title contender in the UFC light heavyweight division, I need to be making sure that I am able to put 
fighters to sleep. I am able to put fighters to bed very, very early, put on an entertaining performance and look confident. If I can't do that, then I'm not going to be able to work my way up the rankings and get close to that title shot. And I know I'm very, very close there because two of the guys that I've beat previously and Jamal Hill and, uh, and Kalaev have been fighting for the titles. We've got Jamal Hill this weekend on the same card with Ankalaev versus Jan Blasiewicz. So I'm in the mix. I know I'm there. I know I can beat some of the top contenders in this top five. And I just need 2023 to be the year of the run. What does that mean to you? You're the only guy to find him out, Hill. So does that reassure you or you know reinforce that you are a champion in waiting? It definitely does. You know, you, you like to compare yourself to everybody else in this sport because that's the only way you know you're going to get better when you're watching a fight and you're thinking, oh, I can do it. I know what I would be doing in this situation. I've done this and done that and done that and had all these different scenarios. So knowing that I've got a victory over the young buck in the division um, who has some crazy knockout power, uh, and I think that's why the UFC have given this title shot because he's exciting. He came, he came onto the scene in the Dana White Contender Series, was touching people putting them to sleep. And that's what the UFC is all about. It's all about that entertainment factor. And this guy in Jamal Hill has it. And that's, for me, I know there's an opportunity when Jamal Hill gets that title for me to be like, listen, can I, uh, can we try to rectify this loss in your record? And Jamal Hill's a, a really nice guy and I believe that he would be more than happy to, to do that. If you win this fight, uh, is, is Anthony Smith an obvious one as a title eliminator? Yeah, I believe so. If you look at that top 10 at the moment, there's a few guys already matched. There's a few guys injured, some long-term injuries like in uh, Nikita Krylov and uh, Prohaska, long-term injuries. So that top five, when you think I'm number eight, if you take them two out of the division, because I'm not going to be fighting for within the next 16 months maybe, then that pushes me up to like in the top six. And then if you look at who's in front of me, we Ankalaev, Jamal Hill, these are two guys that I've already beaten. So when you start looking at it that way, the the there's an option of fighting Anthony Smith. It's a it's a fight that we've been looking for for years. Um, he did offer us that many uh, a few fights back, and then he ended up taking the fight with Ankalaev. So there is there is an opportunity to see me and Anthony Smith share the octagon. Um, he's a great MMA ambassador. You know the UFC and ESPN put a lot of faith in him. We've been part of the commentating team and all this kind of stuff. He's a thinking man's uh, fighter, and I like that. And um, it's not just going to be this guy who comes out and swings heavy shots and tries to put you away early. He actually, he's a calculated fighter, and that's why I think that's maybe a an interesting battle for us. But first and foremost, we need to get by Saturday. We need to do the victory in Brazil against Johnny Walker. Was Yuri Prohaska a breath of fresh air, do you think, for this division? Yeah, I definitely think Prohaska is a breath of fresh air in this division. You know, it's been a wee bit topsy turvy. For the best way to describe it is when the king left, the king being John Jones, when he advocated the throne and uh, left it to everybody else to fight over. We've not really seen a dominating champion, and I thought Prohaska was going to be that guy. Um, one of the best fights there last year was Prohaska versus. Um, Glover, and that's why they then tried to remake it for this show in Brazil. Didn't harm through injuries, through all the things that happen in their sport, you know, getting injured, training, picking up knocks, all this kind of stuff in fights. And it's still kind of topsy turvy. And I believe that within the next six to eight months, we're going to see a dominant champion. We're going to see somebody who's putting on performances, not quite like John Jones did back in the day, but I believe the skill set and what the fighters in the top 10 are now is much higher than what John Jones was going up against. So it's harder to keep a hold of the title in this division. What does it mean to you to come to Brazil, uh, the land of jiu-jitsu, as, as one of Europe's best? And, you know, we don't see a lot of people coming from Scotland getting to the highest level by being an incredible yeah, okay. grappler. You, you know, you're very unique in that sense. So what does this mean to your legacy to go in Brazil and take this challenge on? Yeah, we know, well know who the family is that started uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu. The name Gracie holds a lot of weight in Brazil for jiu-jitsu. But the name is Scottish. <clears throat> so the Scottish blood that runs through the Gracie family, runs through my lineage. And um, although I might not be Brazilian, I've got it in the bag for the jiu-jitsu. I've got the, the passion uh, and I've got the, the drive to constantly learn and constantly get better. And over the last few years, I've decided to do more 
grappling competitions to test my skill in the world of jiu-jitsu, but the game's moved on so quickly. It's one of these things where in MMA, if someone tries to do some heel hooks, some leg locks, you're going to punch them out. But in the world of combat, uh, non-combat jiu-jitsu, so point scoring, winning matches through submissions, these guys are just trying to jump on legs and rip heels and all this kind of stuff. So at the moment, where being part of the UFC, I can't really be involved in having guys trying to snap my Achilles tendons, having guys trying to destroy my ACLs and all this kind of stuff. So it's it's difficult to get and to compete with it with the, the high level jiu jitsu guys. But going to going from Scotland to Brazil and beating Brazilian guys in their home tough way, my skill set is it just shows you the level of what's happening in Europe, the level of fighter that's coming out of Europe, the level of fighter that's coming out of the UK, the level of fighter that's coming out of Scotland. It's, it's great to be part of this and see the sport of MMA, UFC grow. Going to wrap up with a little quick fire about your UFC colleagues, if that's all right with you. So, uh, hardest yep. hitter in the UFC? Oh, it has to be, um, well, it was Francis Ngannou. It was, but uh, obviously he's 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 uh, <clears throat> he's gone. So let's go, Stepe Miocic. You know, boxing's crisp. He's got that extra weight. So I'm going to go, Stepe. Nice one. I've never, I've not had a vote for Stepe yet. Uh, best wrestler. Oh, it would have been Daniel Cormier, uh, but obviously he's retired. So Islam Makachev. Who's the funniest? Oh, funny. No very many funny guys in this division. Uh, I'm going to go. I quite like Hazmat Chimaev and Darren Till's kind of banner. The bank forward was pretty cool. So let's go Darren Till and Chimaev. Who's the most annoying? Oh, I think everybody dislikes Henry Cejudo, doesn't he? Like I've I've got no reason to dislike this guy. He's no part of my division. But I think quite a lot of people just get on his back and say he's a bit cringy. But who's the most annoying? Um. I don't know. We need to go Henry Sudo. He's the only name that's springing to mind at the moment. Who's the best looking? Oh, it's easy, man. It's myself. Some would say a, a, a handsome, a handsomer version of Oscar Isaac. Uh, he's got the he's got the 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 body of a swimmer and the face of Oscar Isaac. So I think that's a good combination to have in the UFC. Strong compliment. Strong beard as well. Uh, who's, <laughs> who's the most stylish? Best dressed, his, yeah, Israel Adesanya. Um, he always seems to you know quite nice suits, uh, looking sharp. Um, I kind of like I kind of like his style. So I'm gonna go Izzy. And uh, who has the highest fight IQ? Oh, it was always GSP for me, the way he could adapt in the octagon. But right now, highest IQ in the UFC goes to um, Leon Edwards. The, the ability to turn that, turn, go to his corner and come back at that fifth round and turn that around in one round. That's high, that's high IQ for me in this sport. That was magic. Uh, who's got the coolest tattoos? Oh, it was uh, Dan Tills, that picture he had. Remember, he used to have a picture, but I think he started to cover it up. Uh, it was a picture of like, a girl that he, I don't know, I remember it was like, when it, it was like, uh, he used to say it was Paige. And uh, I think it was like, maybe some some chick that he was seen back in the day, and now it's a bit awkward, you know, and he's, so I kind of like that tattoo. A great tattoo, like the skill that's been put in that has to be that. And um, who would you most like to have dinner with? Dinner with? Oh, do, 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 do. let's go Shevchenko. Let's go Shevchenko. Uh, I think she's a kind of cool cat and a nice meal to have her. Perhaps that's my next, uh, the next answer then. Uh, who's, the, <clears throat> who's the most interesting female fighter? Shevchenko again. Oh, no. Aye, it has to be Shevchenko. Um, she's a bit of a phenom at the moment with skill set. She, the way she looks, the way she acts, everything that goes along with her as a champion and as a, a female fighter. You know, she she holds the the sport at a very high standard for female athletes. Who would you most want by your side in a street fight? Uh, Chris Bungard. Uh, he's my teammate. He's the guy who 
shoots for the hip and asks question later. I think you need to have that. If there's a street fight going down, Chris Bungard's the guy who's got your back. Last question. Dream fight, any weight class, past or present? Oh, let's go for uh, Enzo Gracie. I know he obviously came from, like he was in the part of the world of Japanese MMA and this shoot boxing, but I think that'd be kind of cool. You know, he's a, a bit of stud, so let's go Enzo Gracie. Maximum respect. It's been fun, man. Thank you very much.